Hello, welcome to COM 222 Intercultural Communications. Today we're going to be talking about diversity in East Asia and India. Your past experiences affect your behavior in both subtle and obvious ways. However, people often overlook its impacts on social perception and interaction. Think of one of those times when you and a friend shared what you believe to be the same experience, yet when you discuss the event later, you discover there were differences in your perceptions of that quote-unquote shared experience. The stimuli you receive from the environment was the same as your friend, but because each of you has your own unique perspective and history, you experienced a specialized set of feelings, sensations, and responses. In short, we all have our private histories that shape the way we see the world. It is our perception of reality. So you and your friend are at a party. You see your friend being harassed by a guy, but your friend actually says, oh, no, I thought he was kind of nice. He was very sweet. You both experience the same thing, you just see things differently. It's like we all have our own pair of goggles in which we see the world. You are not only a, a product of your personal experiences, but you are also influenced by your cultural experiences, especially the societal experiences and values. How you behave and think is an expression of what you have learned i.e. the cultural instructions you grew up learning, either implicitly or explicitly. Explicit culture is when the rules are stated directly, either orally or in writing, and may be imposed by an authority figure such as a leader. So, you know, if you think about religion, we celebrate Christmas if you're Christian or Catholic, Ramadan if you're Muslim, and Hanukkah if you're Jewish. If you are somebody who is an atheist who's putting up a Christmas tree, people are questioning you because, you know, that seems to be a contradiction. Implicit culture is not always expressed or discussed and may simply be group members assuming that certain norms exist and accept them by a nonverbal agreement. For example, standing facing forward in a crowded elevator of strangers. So, you know, you get into the elevator, there's six other people in there, everybody's facing the exit door, and then do this. Walk in. Don't turn around. Stare at the strangers. They will be very uncomfortable. It'll be very awkward because this is an implicit culture. This is something we all kind of agree personally. Because these behaviors are so much a part of your persona, there is a danger that you might fail to remember that these behaviors are culturally created and usually vary from culture to culture. The need for intercultural understanding should be obvious. We live in a world where people of diverse cultures are in constant interaction with one another. When people of different backgrounds have to communicate, the challenges of communicating effectively are heightened by the different internal cultural states and feelings. Two principles are crucial if you are to relate effectively to people from varied international cultures. One, you must have knowledge about the diversity of people from other cultures. And two, you must respect their differences. So, you know, we have to understand and we have to respect. And that's really a very simple instruction for everything in our lives. You have to learn about it, you have to understand it, and then once you understand it, you will respect it generally. So we're going to talk about two main religions that have impacted uh, their respective geographies significantly. Confucianism and Hinduism. And Confucius is the guy on the left with the really cool mustache and beard. And um, Hinduism, which is a wide pantheon of gods, um, but they're all one god. 
so it's they have different elements and we'll talk about this in more detail in a few minutes but um, this religious context is a huge influence on the Eastern world so to start we will examine the essay the impact of Confucianism on interpersonal relationships and communication patterns in East Asia by June Ok Yum so East Asia is made up of Greater China, Japan, Mongolia, North Korea, and South Korea. New technology has removed many of the physical barriers regarding communication between the East and the West, but the philosophical and cultural barriers remain. The increased opportunity for interaction between different cultural groups has sensitized some scholars to the need to study Eastern perspectives on communication. One of the main differences between East Asian and North American perspectives on communication is the East Asian emphasis on social relationships as opposed to the North American emphasis on individualism. Hofstede has extensively researched the paradigm of the individualism collectivism as one of the primary characteristics that differentiate color cultures in East Asia the emphasis is on social relationships and their maintenance rather than any abstract concern for a general collective body in a sense it is a collectivism only among those bound by social networks so when we think of East Asia we think of people who are looking out for the general good whereas in the United States it's more about what's good for me and that's not saying it's a bad thing I'm just saying that that's the general perspective on how people operate in communication in these two different areas of the world so recently a study on the Chinese value system found that the Confucian value of reciprocity and proper relationships was not in fact correlated with Hofstede's individualism collectivism dimension. Consequently, Hui and Triandis have recommended that the term collectivism be defined in two different ways as a concern for a general for a certain subset of people, and second, as a concern for a generalized collectivity of people. Now, in the United States, we have what's called individualism. And in the 1830s, the French social philosopher Alexis de Tocqueville coined the term individualism to describe the most notable characteristic of the American people. According to Varine, there is but one system of principles regulating interpersonal relationships in America, and that is individualism, which is the focus on independence, self-reliance, and initiative. American communicators are perceived to be separate individuals engaging in communication to maximize his or her own self-interest. Hall and Beardsley have maintained that, compared to East Asian countries, North America does not prioritize social relationships. So, in a sense, what they're saying is, if it benefits me, I'm going to communicate in a certain way, even if it negatively impact someone that is close to me. In the philosophical and cultural history of East Asia, Confucianism has endured as the basic social and political value system for a thousand years. It is a philosophy of human nature that considers proper human relationships as the basis of society. Confucianism was established and circulated both through the formal curricula of schools and through governmental policies. At least three of the four principles of Confucianism deal directly with social relationships. Under such a strong influence, East Asian countries have developed impersonal relationship patterns that are quite different from the individualistic pattern of North America. Now, I just want to take a moment to make a comment because some of you might be going well isn't China and North Korea communist which basically believes that you know religion is not important 
and you're right. However, the influence, that social influence that has come down through the generations is going to be impacted by Confucianism because communism only took hold, especially in these two regions in the early 20th century. So now we're going to look at particularistic versus universalistic relationships. Confucian ethics and norms are based on relationships and situations rather than on some absolute or abstract good. So what that's saying is that it's based on who you are in my life, which is what I will do in terms of the ethics and norms that I practice, whereas an absolute, absolute or abstract good, such as fairness or um, loyalty, those are abstract. There's no definitions that can be put in place that are always going to be absolute. You know, if you say somebody's good, yeah, well, in third grade, they kicked their teacher. So, you know, there's always these human relationships that um, you can never apply an absolute to or a universal concept to. Human relationships under Confucianism are not universalistic, but particularistic. Instead of applying the same rule to everybody with whom they interact, East Asians rank and regulate relationships according to, one, the level of intimacy, two, the status of the persons involved, and three, the particular context. The um, video, or the cartoons over there on the right-hand side, in America, we have a manager saying, I don't care if you're the son of the boss, you still have to stand in line. Whereas in Singapore, the son of the boss gets ushered right to the front of the room, or the line. Now, you might say, well, yeah, that happens a lot in the U.S. too. People get preferential treatment, and that's true. But generally, when we are in a um, situation, we always tend to think of what is fair. That tends to be our overriding concern, whereas in East Asia, fairness is not even an issue. From a North American point of view, applying different rules to different people and situations may seem to violate the code of fairness an equality that accompanies the individualistic values. In North America, human relationships are not particularized. Rather, you are supposed to treat each person as an integral individual and apply general and objective rules. The East Asian approach suggests that it is more humanitarian to consider the particular context and the persons involved in understanding the action and behavior rather than evaluate them according to generalized rules which to a certain extent are impersonal. So let's get back to this concept of reciprocity. Reciprocity is an embodiment of the core concept in Confucianism just as individualism is the core concept of nor the North American culture. While people may voluntarily join together for specific purposes in North America, each individual remains equal and independent. People join or drop out of clubs without any serious group sanctions. Commitments and obligations are often perceived as threats to one's autonomy or freedom of action. In contrast, Confucian philosophy views relationships as complementary, otherwise known as balanced, or asymmetrical, otherwise known as one-sided, and they are obligated to reciprocate. In this philosophy, a person is forever indebted to others, who in turn are constrained by other debts. Dependence is not looked down upon, rather dependency is accepted as a necessary part of human relationships. So the concept of a lone wolf, so to speak, you know, that person who doesn't need anyone and needs nothing from anything, it doesn't really exist too often in East Asian culture. 
North American culture does not distinguish as strongly between in-group members and out-group members as East Asian countries do. Mutual dependence is prescribed by the Confucian principle, and it requires that a person be affiliated and identify with relatively small and tightly knit groups of people over long periods of time. People enmeshed in this kind of network make clear distinctions between in-group and out-group members. For example, language codes for in-group members are often different from those for out-group members when a word means for a person inside the group and what it means for the person who is outside the group may mean something drastically different for example apes to you may mean a big furry monkey but to a motorcycle enthusiast apes are the very tall handlebars so you know this in group is you know it's it's that dialogue it's that that terminology that is used by a particular group so, I mean, it's professional, you know, talk to somebody from IT and you will get all kinds of um, terminology being thrown at you and most of it is completely incomprehensible. But that is their shortcut conversation. Another important aspect, especially when working with people in East Asia, is understanding that because the difference between in-group and out-group members is so strict it is imperative to have an intermediary i.e. someone who organizes the meeting to help initiate a new relationship in East Asia the informal intermediary has an in-group relationship with both parties and so can connect them one strategy is for your, the intermediary to emphasize an existing relationship that links the two parties for example explaining that you are both graduates of you know XYZ college or you are both from the same city or you both like baseball intermediaries in the United States however are mostly professional or contractual in nature lawyers negotiators marriage counselors the intermediary is an objective third person who does not have any knowledge of the party's characteristics other than those directly related to the issues at hand so you know in Asia you need someone who does the introductions in the United States you have to put your own hand out there and say hi there I'm so and so so it, it's just seen as a more appropriate way to do things in East Asia the Confucian concepts leads to a strong distaste for a purely business transaction carried out on a calculated and contractual basis therefore in East Asian countries there is a tendency to mix the personal with the public relationship according to the principles of social reciprocity there are several steps to follow if you want to develop an effective business relationship in Korea five items number one have frequent contacts over a relatively lengthy period of time number two establish a personal and human relationship number three if possible plan some common experiences such as sports drinking or other types of socializing number four foster mutual understanding in terms of personality and personal situations and number five, develop a certain level of trust in a favorable attitude. The goal is to shrink the distinction between a personal relationship and a public relationship. Now to contrast that, we're going to look at the United States' view of personal and public relationships, which, as that picture might imply, there's a very sharp separation. Some perceive private life as a haven from the pressure of an individualistic, competitive public life, and as such, it should be protected. Um, in France, which I know is not in the United States, but nonetheless, it's an interesting concept, they passed a law saying employers can't text employees or contact them through email on their days off, on their vacation. So, you know, this is a very important element to a lot of Americans. Now, workaholics, they're always working, sure. 
but a lot of us just don't want to be bothered when we're with our families. Others believe that fraternization between employees and clients will lead to negative outcomes, such as stealing clients when a person leaves their job. There is also the idea that if you socialize with your coworker and employees, then the authority you hold is lost and you won't have their respect. So the first time your employees see you drunk and throwing up on the side of the road, that may impact how they see you going forward. And I know that sounds basic. However, you know, um, a lot of us have to go through that to really get to that point where they under we understand we have to maintain that professional distance in the workplace. Since the main function of communication under Confucian philosophy is to initiate, develop, and maintain social relationships, there is a strong emphasis on the kind of communication that promotes such relationships. For instance, it is very important in East Asia to engage in small talk before initiating business and to communicate personalized information, especially information that would help place each person in the proper context. In contrast, when the main function of communication is to actualize autonomy and self-fulfillment, as is in North America, the outcome of the communication is more important than the process. So now we're going to look at a concept called differentiated versus less differentiated linguistic codes. East Asian languages are very complex and are differentiated according to social status, the degree of intimacy, age, sex, and level of formality. This is associated with the Confucian ethical rules that place the highest value on proper human relationships and good manners. One of the main differences between English, Japanese, and Korean is the levels of speech. In both Korean and Japanese, there are two axes of distinction, the axis of address and the axis of reference. The axis of address is divided into plain, polite, and honorific, while the axis of reference is divided into humble and neutral while a humble form is used to refer to the sender's action. So, you know, depending on who you're speaking to, you're either going to be very humbled or you're being treated like a king. Um, on the other side of the coin is either somebody's going to chat with you like you're just a regular old person or they're going to be overly polite. The English language also employs different codes depending upon intimacy and status difference between the speaker and the listener. In general, however, English forms of address are reasonably well described by a single binary contrast. First name versus title plus last name. So either Hi Victor or Hi Dr. Chen. In English, the speech level is defined mainly by how you address a person, while in Korean or Japanese, Pronouns, verbs, and nouns all have different levels depending upon who you are speaking with. In English, to eat is to eat regardless of the person addressed. In the Korean language, however, there are three ways of saying to eat. Mukda, Dushinda, and Chapsu Shinda, which is the honorific. The importance of social relationships in Confucian societies has therefore promoted the differentiation of linguistic codes to accommodate highly differentiated relationships. Most cultures have both direct and indirect modes of communication. Metaphor, insinuations, innuendos, hints, sarcasm, and irony are only a few examples of the kinds of indirect communication that can be found in most linguistic communities. Brown and Levinson have suggested that indirect speech acts are universal because they perform a basic service in strategies of politeness. Even though the indirect speech acts are universal, however, the degree to which it is used varies from culture to culture. Other indirect forms of communication include mediated communication, asking someone else to transmit the message, refracted communication, 
talking to a third person in the presence of the hearer, and number three, acting as a delegate, conveying one's message as being from someone else. The Confucian legacy of consideration for others and concern for proper human relationships has led to the development of communication patterns that preserve one another's face. Saving face defines a strategy to avoid humiliation or embarrassment, to maintain dignity or preserve one's reputation. Indirect communication helps to prevent embarrassment or disagreement among individuals, leaving the relationship and each other's face intact. Lebra suggests that defending face is one of the main factors that influences Japanese behavior. Comparing Japanese and American organizations, American employees strive to communicate with each other in clear, precise, and explicit manner, while Japanese often deliberately communicate in a vague and indirect manner. North American communication very often centers on the sender and the linear one-way model from sender to receiver was the prevailing model of communication. Chang has identified infinite interpretation as one of the main principles of Chinese communication. The emphasis is on the receiver and listening rather than the, the sender or speech making. According to Lebra, anticipatory communication is common in Japan in which instead of the speaker having to tell or ask for what he or she wants specifically, others guess and accommodate his or her needs sparing him or her embarrassment in case the verbally expressed request cannot be met. In North America, efforts to improve communication through such training such as public speaking whereas in East Asia the effort has been on improving the receiver's sensitivity or listening ability. The highest sensitivity is reached when one empties the mind of one's preconceptions and makes it clear as a mirror. So we're going to move on now to Hinduism and India. This is a, from an essay by Nemi C. Jain and it's called Some Basic Cultural Patterns of India. So why do we study these basic cultural patterns of India? India is one of the most important countries in Asia with approximately 1.2 billion residents, the largest democracy in the world, and her leadership role among developing nation underscores her importance in international relations. So India and China have very similar population numbers. We always think of China because they're more advanced manufacturing, but when you call a help desk, who are you getting? It's because many people in India already speak English. The major aim of this article is to outline some of the basic cultural patterns that have persisted over thousands of years of Indian history, patterns that continue to influence many aspects of Indian social institutions and that affects communication and thought patterns. A major aspect of the culture in India is religion. 80% of the citizens are Hindu, which basically means almost a billion people in India are Hindu. Hinduism is a pantheistic religion. It equates God with the universe. However, the Hindu religion is also polytheistic. There are many gods and goddesses who characterize aspects of the one true God allowing individuals an infinite number of ways to worship based on family tradition, community, and regional practices. One of the unique characteristics of Indian culture is its worldview involving the Hindu concepts of Brahman and Atman. Brahman in Hinduism is the supreme being, a philosophical absolute, serenely blissful beyond all limitations, Brahman is the supreme reality. The Atman refers to the real self beyond ego or false self. It is often referred to as a spirit or soul and indicates our true self or essence which underlies our existence. Hinduism recognizes the relationship between living and non-living parts of the universe. It emphasizes the need for understanding the nature of relationships among human beings. 
Hinduism lays considerable emphasis on the value of all created life, including animals, birds, and trees. A Hindu cannot believe in the Brahman without believing also in a firm bond among all people, since they are all manifestations of the Brahman. Furthermore, a Hindu cannot really believe in any individual as a distinct and separate person, because Hinduism contends that each individual is only a tiny part of the whole universe, which is Brahman. So, moving on, Hindus believe in reincarnation, and this affirms that an individual soul enters the world by God's power and passes through a sequence of bodies or life cycles. The individual soul, as a human being, is fully responsible for its behavior through the doctrine of karma, the concept of cause and effect, the present condition of each individual life is a product of what one did in the previous life, and one's present acts, thoughts, and decisions are determining one's future states. The character that each individual builds will continue into the future unit he or she realizes oneness with God. So, for a Hindu, their entire existence is looking forward to when their soul unites with God's soul. And really, if you break down religion, that's pretty much what most religions, um, the ultimate goal is. So, you know, in this concept, you live your life over and over again as different beings and different individuals, different animals. And however you acted in that lifetime will then come out and tell you who you're like in the next lifetime. Are you paying for your sins, or are you being rewarded? The concept of Dharma is another unique feature of Hinduism and Indian culture. Dharma refers to a code of conduct that guides a person both as an individual and as a member of society throughout the history of Indian society. Dharma does not force people into virtue, but trains them for it. It is not a fixed code of mechanical rules but a living spirit that grows and moves in response to the development of the society. Dharma has two sides that are interdependent, the individual and the social. Dharma, on the social level, is that which holds together all living beings in a harmonious order. Virtue, or beneficial behavior, is, conduct, is conduct contributing to social welf welfare and vice, or sin, is the opposite. It is frequently insisted that the highest virtue consists in doing to others as you would be done by. So it's that golden rule, you know, treat others as you would like to be treated. And that's a fairly universal thought process. India has a very interesting system. Um, up until the 1940s, it, there was a caste system. Now, in the 1940s, India gained their independence from Great Britain, thank you to Gandhi, and one of the conditions Gandhi set was that the Indian people had to eliminate the caste system, which technically they have done. However, the reality is that a lot of people still follow the caste system. In the United States, you know, we eliminated racism, so to so to speak, in 1964 with the Civil Rights Bill, but racism still exists, so it's the same concept. The caste system is a unique feature. It, the caste rules relate to the social status and functions of individual. The particular caste a person belongs to is determined by birth. Each caste has its appropriate status, rights, and duties. There are detailed rules about communication and contact among people of different castes. Indian society has been divided into the fourfold classification of castes from highest to lowest. The Brahmins, which are the priests or seers who teach, preach, assist in the sacrificial, sacrificial processes, and give alms. The Kshatriyas are the protectors of life and treasure identified with the administrative or the ruling classes. The Vasayas 
cultivators, tradespeople, business people, and herders, and the sutras, the artists and specialists such as carpenters, blacksmiths, and laborers. And you'll see the caste system is represented by a triangle. Now you'll notice that there's a group underneath that sutra group called the out of castes. This is the lowest class, caste. In the course of time there developed a fifth group, ranked so low as to be considered outside and beneath society, often called the untouchables. People in this group inherit the kinds of work that in India is considered least desirable such as scavenging, slaughtering animals, leather tanning, and sweeping the streets and footpaths. So, you know, what we have here is we have this group that are living these terrible conditions. And you have to ask yourself, why are they living these terrible conditions? Well, from the Hindu perspective, they are paying for the sins of a previous lifetime. And this is karma at work. So, in a way, it validates and justifies poverty and and deprivation. Indian culture has been seen to embody such basic values as creation and blending, desire to know the truth, nonviolence, and above all the attitude of toleration. The view of Indian culture has further explained the role and influence of Hindu thought as it is visible in Indian culture and has shown that the two are in fact inseparable. So that's it for this week. If you have any questions, please email or text your instructor. If, on the other hand, you are not in our class but still have a question, please leave a comment and we will get back to you as soon as we can. Thank you and have a fabulous day.